Hello everyone and welcome back to the Belgium Beer Brothers channel, Cedric here in Antwerp, today with another brewery breakdown for a change. And believe it or not, finding out the history for today's brewery was a request from a viewer. Uh, Patrick is a serious alambic head from Germany and he messaged me, we got together, explored the city, uh, Antwerp of course, and had a few beers and he was kind enough to bring me these treasures so the request was accompanied by a gift um, much appreciated of course so this is a threefold request you might have guessed that this was uh, quite a challenge since Contignon which we're gonna talk about is a staple name in uh, lambic brewing and even uh, even though the brewery was founded in 1900 the story didn't start there but does it ever right also, this story will bring some other big names in Goes and Lambic together. So let's dig a little deeper. The story of Cantillon has uh, several detours, but technically starts with a grain merchant called Auguste Cantillon, whose eldest son Paul had no interest whatsoever in taking over the family business. But he was in fact a talented and driven uh, hobby brewer. At first, as a hobby, but August soon began to realize that maybe he should look into this son's uh, hobby a bit more and set him up for a decent career. Now, unfortunately, starting a brewery was very expensive, but August kept looking around and made several attempts to take over breweries in the vicinity of Anderlecht, where they lived. In 1893, a deal with Van Roy in Tervure went south but by 1894 his patience was rewarded and he took over the Van de Zande Van Roy brewery in Honsocht, a small part of Lembeek. And this is uh, where we back up a few steps and redirect our attention to another brewery first. So way, way, way back in uh, 1680, Jean Claus started uh, a brewery on the family farm in Honsocht in Lembeek. And in 1695, he added a gin still to the premises. He carefully chose uh, this place because back then Lembeek was what they called a free city between uh, Brabant and Henegouwen, meaning it wasn't subject to the rules and excise duties that go with alcohol production of either of the two. So not uh, Brabant and not Henegouwen. Business flourished and the Glass family expanded. They bought some more land, some more farms, and in 1708, Jean's son Jean Baptiste uh, joins the family business. A year later, Jean Baptiste marries to Marie Jeanne Cloc and in doing so adds another gin still to the center of Lembeek to the business. On October 8, 1720, however, an imperial decree was issued stating that, uh, from that day on, the free cities of Brabant were obliged to pay taxes on all production of wine and gin too. However, there was a caveat, beer was not mentioned in this decree. So, luckily, back in the days, uh, a brewing kennel and a gin still were actually very much alike. And basically, it was like um, changing hats and that was enough. So the Glass family started producing way more beer than gin in Honsocht uh, and, and Lembeek as well. But then this got the attention of the Brewers Guild, Sint Joris, who then filed a complaint against Glass for brewing outside the guild in 1726. Fun fact, uh, in 1711 Jean-Baptiste's uh, nephew was named Dean of the Guild and because of some family feud, uh, Jean-Baptiste's membership was declined. Anywho, the Princess of Steenhuizen and Dame of Lembeek received the complaint and intervened by giving the Glass family permission to brew and after the construction of a new main road uh, right alongside the brewery, business flourished even more and Glass kept expanding. By the way, I say uh, alongside the brewery they actually had to tear down two buildings uh, for it uh, and constructed new ones a bit further uh, on the grounds. But that new main road did make business flourish even more. The French caught wind of this free regime and 
Belgian saw this as unfair competition for their brandy and other alcoholic beverages. So during the French Revolution they worked their way up to the top. And by Christmas of 1794, and I do mean that literally, December 23rd, all brewing and distilling activities in Lembeek were prohibited by the French government, who was then in control. They won up the entire operation by getting rid of alcohol taxes in general. So brewing in Lembeek uh, no longer had any benefits whatsoever over the rest of the area. The Glass family lost all profits of the operations and closed the brewery down. Now, after the revolution, the law stayed intact until 1808, after which Glass went back to distilling, but left the brewery untouched. In 1809, the descendants of Jean Glass rented out the brewery to Jean-Baptiste Paul, who brewed here for several decades, until in 1860 his son Louis Paul uh, bought the lot and renamed it to Brasserie Saint-Roche. I have no idea where that name came from. Louis started brewing Lambic uh, and started experimenting with aging and blending different batches of Lambic, later called Geuse. Now, another fun fact, the name Geuse is believed by some to have originated here as Louis Paul was also mayor of Lembeek, as happens to brewers quite often, and in 1870 he got the nickname De Geus for his liberal politics. So the people call this beer Lambic van bij de Geus, or Lambic from the Geus brewery. Some believe, by the way, that the term Lambic also originated here, since Lembeek was home to over 40 breweries in the early 1800s, and lambic uh, would be the corrupted pronunciation of the uh, francophone, the French people uh, calling lembic lambic. Others believe that lambic is named after the alambic, uh, so I guess we'll never know for sure. Anyway, in 1870, Louis Paul hired an engineer called Caillards to help him experiment with the méthode champenoise, as he had seen uh, at Tom Perignon estate in France, and after about five years of research and experimenting, the Geuse Lambic was bottled at Brasserie Saint-Roche in, uh, in 1875 for the very first time. In 1890, Louis added a malting to the estate and yeah, we just kept growing. Now, by lack of succession, Louis was forced to sell the brewery when he headed towards his pension in 1898. Enter Pierre Troch, who bought the brewery and installed the first steam kettles. But fate struck, of course. 1898, a bit later, World War I started. And as you might have guessed by now, the Germans confiscated the copper kettles in 1917, leaving the brewery useless for a while. In 1918, the kettles were replaced by iron ones. And as the war ended, Pierre's son, René, uh, takes over the brewery, renaming it Hygiena. Partly to emphasize the purity and cleanliness of the brewing process now that they got iron kettles, uh, even though the name had occurred earlier. Alas, uh, Hygiena, which reminds us of hygiene, went bankrupt in 1927 due to the implications of the economical crisis following World War I. Joseph de Witz, a local tavern owner and Geus blender, buys the estate and runs it under the de Witz brewery name uh, in Lembeek for about 10 years until his son, also called René, takes the reins and continues the family blendery. René narrows the portfolio down to just Lambic, Geus, Creek and Faro and when the kettles are removed uh, because of a defect, he refuses to replace them and switches to buying wort from Van Halen in Brussels, Winderings in Dorp, uh, and the Union des Marchands de Bière in Brussels, who had several breweries that catered to their members. René not only refused to replace the kettles, he refused to invest in the brewery in general. Uh, the only assets that he added to the brewery uh, well, in general, were a Citroën truck in 1937, a Volkswagen van in 1962, and 12 steel kegs in, 16, uh, in 1965. And that's it. 
So the brewery had no heating, uh, no electricity at some places. There were only a handful of rooms that had electricity. And they produced less than 150 hectoliters per year. Years later, René took on a young uh, employee called Frank Bond to help out every once in a while. And Frank became a Geuss blender himself in an old sugar factory in Halle, near Brussels. But upon retiring, René offered Frank to take over the brewery, or what was left of it, and much against everyone's advice, Frank took a leap of faith and bought the De Vitz estate, uh, starting what grew out to his own Geuss empire, actually, the, the Frank Bohm empire. At the time, his parents, uh, his father was a bank manager, weren't stoked about this decision, and his great uncle uh, Raymond Bohm, who was then a board member of Artois, even predicted that by the year 2000, none of those small breweries will exist anymore. Did he prove him wrong? So much for the story of Lembeek. The part that's relevant for this story is Pierre Troch buying the, the estate in 1898. But what does this have to do with Cantillon? Well, let's take a look at the Cantillon family. Like I said, in the beginning of this video, Auguste Cantillon is a grain merchant in the second half of the 19th century. His oldest son, Paul, had no interest in stepping into his father's footsteps, but he is interested in brewing, so Auguste is on the lookout to take over a brewery. And he finds this in the form of uh, the brewery Van der Zande van Roy, who might have ties to brewery, uh, the breweries in Wiese and maybe even Palm in Steenhuffel. Uh, the name is right. I didn't find uh, anything, any of that confirmed, but I digress again. In 1894, August manages to buy the brewery to set up his sons Paul and Emile with a career and a future. He changes the name to Cantillon Frères, the brothers Cantillon, helps starting up uh, the new company and remains active until he retires and leaves the brewery in his son's hands in 1899. However, he does stick around for a while. Paul managed to stay on for another year, but since Paul and his father weren't the best of friends and they didn't always see eye to eye, Paul leaves Cantillon Frère. Among other things, Paul was frustrated that the lambic brewed by his father-in-law was softer and more pleasant on the palate, so he headed out to start his own blendery with his wife, Marie Troch, the daughter of Pierre Troch, at the site where Cantillon is still located today. That way he had full control over the taste and the feel and the entirety of the end product. Until 1900, Brasserie du Dragon was located at this address, known for beer and vinegar, which wasn't odd at the time. And I have seen a large plaque for Cantillon with a dragon depicted, uh, which might hint to that period, but again, I haven't found any links or confirmation about that. Um, Lambic.info, the, the Lambic Wikipedia, let's say, did confirm uh, with Jean Van Roy that research on the historical connection between Cantillon and Brasserie du Dragon is currently underway. So I'm uh, very excited about that, and eagerly awaiting it. Now, Paul and Marie didn't brew anything themselves, but merely ran a blendery under the name Cantillon. They bought their word from Cantillon Frère, so Paul's brother, Emile, and Saint Roche, Marie's dad, until they both ceased to exist in uh, respectively 1925 and 1927. Paul and Marie got four children, Robert, Marcel, Georgette and Fernande. And upon expanding the business after World War I, the two sons joined the business. So now it was Paul, Robert and Marcel. They keep buying and blending wort from other breweries and businesses, and the business is thriving until they get the chance to purchase Brasserie Nationale du Nez Blanc in Ouffet in 1937. The brewing equipment uh, was moved from Ouffet to the Rue Geude, and in 1938 the first batch of Lambic was brewed, shortly before Robert and Marcel were called to mobilize for World War II. When looking at these dates, you might see another upcoming problem. During the war, 
resources were rationed and calculated by the amounts used in the years previous to the war. Since the entire brewing installation was new and both brothers were mobilized, even with special leave, they only managed to brew about 13.8 tons worth of wort. The entire Second World War, their ration of grains was calculated accordingly, leaving the brewery in a near standstill. Now, numerous protests by Father Paul only resulted in a few hundred kilos extra. And as a cherry on top, one of their two delivery trucks also got seized by the Germans. They were hanging on by a thread and post-war people and businesses needed time to recover and sales only reached about 60% of the pre-war numbers. To add insult to injury, in 1974 a massive heat wave destroyed most Lambic brewer stocks including Cantillons. It is estimated that over 3 million bottles exploded uh, because of pressure buildup. There was no air conditioning at the time. And only Bellevue stayed afloat uh, because they sweetened and pasteurized their beer, leaving it immune to the heat wave and to the reactivation of microbiology. Now, thank goodness Contillon recovered fairly quickly as one of the, the only, uh, well, as one of only a few Lambic breweries. And in 1949, they reached more than double their pre-war numbers. In 1952, Paul Cantillon passes away and Robert and Marcel were left to head the brewery and by 1955 the brewery had recovered and reached an all-time high. I read that they brewed uh, 33,600 hectoliters, I'm afraid that has to be 3,360, because this was the result of 56 brews in their 60 hectoliter kettles. Nonetheless, still pretty impressive since it was just the brothers and their seven employees. And bear in mind that Lambic can only be brewed during part of winter, so that means they had to brew at least five brews a week, and in reality probably more, so they will have had days of double brewing. In 1958, Marie Troch also passes away, and the two brothers see this as a perfect time to buy out their sister's shares. By the 1960s, demand for traditional Lambic products in Goes began to decline by about 10% per year and Robert also leaves the business after selling his shares to his brother, making Marcel the sole owner of Brasserie Cantillon. In 1967, Claude, Marcel's daughter, married a young science major called Jean-Pierre Van Roy. We have seen that name before. After almost five years of engagement, and since Marcel was planning on quitting the brewery business too, and Jean-Pierre had been helping out at the brewery uh, in between jobs, on and off since 1963, he reached an agreement with his fresh son-in-law to take over the reins after a short apprenticeship. And so in 1971, Robert Cantillon left Van Roy in charge while he spent most of his days up in his uh, country cottage uh, Eager to crank up production, Van Roy brewed 30 to 35 times per season and bought extra wort from Thuis Troch in Schepdal and René de Vitz in Lembeek. Again, we have seen that name before. He also started to experiment with artificial sweeteners to keep up with the popular taste of Bellevue. Um, but unfortunately, this didn't help and between 1975 and 78, he abandoned artificial sweeteners uh, and such tricks altogether. So they returned to the artisanal process. In 1977, Robert dies and Jean-Pierre decides to reunite the brewery's assets by buying them off of the by then divided family members. He buys the estate and the buildings and pays off the rest of the family and upon passing of his father-in-law he should or would carry the entire inheritance cost as well. Now luckily Marcel lived on for another 15 years until 1992. In order to pay for this endeavor, Jean-Pierre managed to brew over 2000 hectoliters for a few years, after which production actually stabilized between 1000 and 1300 hectoliters per year, but we'll get to that in a minute. 
In an attempt to balance the books, Van Roy opened the brewery to the public in 1978. And just like the Halve Man in Bruges, he even installed a permanent exhibit as the Geurs Museum to attract tourists. Of course, uh, all this had a drawback too, because they had to give up space to house the museum. And due to its uh, cultural character, they had to add an event space as well. There goes another 175 square meters. Now all this means less space to age beers. And nowadays the space would yield a lot more income as sellers for the beer. And the museum is actually no longer strictly necessary for the survival of the brewery. But Cantillon tends to keep it around for its historical and educational values. Luckily, sales began to increase again and in 1986, Cantillon even started exporting to the US, kind of starting or at least contributing um, to the Geus explosion that followed there shortly after. Jean-Pierre also realized that for the business to stay on top, their reputation was most important. And so he started demanding certain warranties from sellers, like making sure that uh, the corked bottles were stored laying flat at all times rather than standing up and he refused to supply to stores that didn't follow his rules. Pretty nice. Jean-Pierre and Claude got three children between 1967 and 1971. Jean, Julie and Magali. Eventually in 1989 Jean-Pierre brought his 22-year-old son Jean into the brewery to start learning on the job, just like he had from his father-in-law and without any previous education. Ever since Jean-Pierre invoked his set of rules, he stayed right on top of things and in the 90s, Cantillon grew out to be one of the most sought after Lambic products in Belgium and maybe even in the world. And they really held their own uh, while a bunch of young breweries rose. Around Marcel's passing in 1992, the brewery regained financial health despite a bunch of costs and Jean-Pierre and Jean were able to invest again. It was around that time that Cantillon drew inspiration from their friends in the winemaking world and changed from traditional oak fooders to stainless steel tanks for blending and fruit maceration. For aging, they primarily used pipes, which are uh, large wine barrels of around 600 to 700 liters. In the case of Cantillon, often uh, old port pipes. But since some of them were over 50 or 60 years old, and they even found some with uh, René Trox name on from the early 1900s, they started to replace the pipes, a few at a time, by second-hand 400 and 500 liter wine barrels from France, Spain and Italy. They even added smaller 20 liter barrels to experiment with. They also changed some things up in the production process. They switched to uh, closed ripening, ripening barrels after cooling the wort, leaving them open for 14 days instead of until the end of the season in April. The barrels are filled to the brim before closing, uh, before they left it yeah, pretty much like two thirds. And they started using bottle caps over the cork, keeping more carbon dioxide in and allowing vertical storage. All these small changes keep the traditional methods intact, but assure quality and consistency in every brew. Now, in 2009, Jean-Pierre officially brewed his last batch of Lambic, and after 20 years of working alongside his father, Jean Van Roy now heads the brewery alone, even though he was officially appointed as director in 2003 already. Being the fourth generation Cantillon brewer, Jean is the first one to experiment with foreign ingredients like several Scandinavian berries um, and, and foreign herbs. Now this is of course not counting the hops, which used to be local, but after the hop farms shrunk or switched to other crops, Cantillon was forced to look into Yakima Valley hops and sometimes German suppliers. Jean and Cantillon have uh, certainly been busy too, because in 2011 Jean closed the deal with the city of Brussels, in which Brussels provides cellar space underneath the city for free for Cantillon to long-term age some high-end and experimental beers. Each cellar 
uh, can fit about 10,000 bottles and they aim to age the beers for several decades. And heck, uh, actually filling them alone will take years and probably decades. While talking to a winemaker in Sicily, where wine is often aged and conditioned in amphoras, Jean-Pierre got the idea to do the same with his beers. A beer from the olden days uh, in a vessel from the antiquities would be a match made in heaven, if you ask Jean-Pierre. So he got 12 amphoras of 200 liters each to play with and the first experiment was the 19th brew of the O season being January 26th, 2012. In 2014, Cantillon also announced that they'd purchased an adjacent building that once housed Brasserie Limbourg by um, Edouard Limbourg, another Lambic blender, that started in 1906 right next door to Cantillon. Limbourg had number 58 and Cantillon was on number 56. Edouard's sons, Nestor and Edgar, assisted in the brewery until Nestor succeeded his father after his passing in 1940. And their nephew François also worked there and eventually married into the Morillot family, who were also lambic brewers, or blenders, I mean, in St. Peter's Leo, about 10 kilometers north of Lembeek. Now, funnily enough, Edouard's older brother, who was also called Nestor, was also a lambic blender in Jaasbeek, a bit west of St. Peter's Leo. He ran the blendery with his son Maurice from 1902 until the 50s when they quit their brewing activities and like many breweries converted to beer merchants. By the way, that is uh, also why we often call a beer merchant and a drink center a brewer in Flanders. But all that to the side. The Lambou family had several cafes and I do believe that one of them is still up and running and even under Lambou family ownership or again under Lambou family ownership namely Edouard's great-grandson Dirk Lambourg. The others were either sold to Artois breweries, now AB InBev, or demolished for other projects like a park or a road. But back to Cantillon. So in 2014 they bought the old Lambourg warehouse next door and this expansion allowed them to double their production actually by the 2016-2017 season. Since Goose production often isn't limited by the size of the kettles, but the size of the warehouse. After all, you need to be able to store a lot of beer for several years, then blend it and store it again. Uh, so yeah, there's a lot of slow stock and slow stock takes time and real estate. And both of those things cost money. Another fun fact, uh, even though the two addresses are adjacent, there was still around 250 meters in between uh, the two buildings. And being a true Puritan when it comes to his beer, uh, Cantillon is, is also not a member of Horal, despite being one of the few artisanal breweries left, but that's another story. So being a Puritan, Jean was afraid that the beer would age differently on the two, in the two buildings due to different microbiomes on the sides. So he made sure that the, the same microbiome was spread out by spraying warts on the walls just in case, and I actually love that kind of dedication in a person. Um, did it work? I guess we'll never know, but why risk it, right? We don't know what the future holds, but with seven grandchildren, uh, I am pretty sure that they will find succession somewhere. And this is where, currently, the Cantillon story stops for me. Of course, I do have these two lovely beers to review. Uh, again, great thanks, Patrick, and especially for the glass. But I must be honest, uh, this was one of the hardest and longest ones yet. Uh, but one I really looked forward to and one I enjoyed a lot. It took me over a day only to find and read all the online resources. Another six hours of podcasts. And luckily, I am used to listening on double speed. Uh, but taking notes slows me down quite a bit and also my French isn't that good, so... I did spend around two and a half hours identifying in which of my books Cantillon is mentioned and reading those parts and taking more notes, a bit more time. 
And then I squeezed in all the anecdotes that I've heard over the years and explored sidetracks like sifting through things I discovered in the books and elaborating on those things again online to eventually summarize all of that into the notes that I have before me right now because yeah, this is not by heart. This was about four times as long as any other video I've ever done, by the way. So, but like I said, I really enjoyed doing this. So thanks a lot, Patrick, for the request, for the beers, for the glass. Um, love your dedication uh, to details. And I will see you when I visit Germany. For the rest of you guys, if you have any requests too, please don't hesitate to leave it in the comments. You might have something I have never thought about. It may take some time, but I will try to honor your request because I have fun doing so. Someone pitched the idea of doing a video on gushing, which I will do in the near future. Um, or if you have any breweries, let me know. Apart from that, if you like this video, let me know, tap the thumb. Uh, if you want to see more, subscribe, hit the bell icon. You'll get notified whenever I upload something, which should be every Monday, Wednesday and Friday uh, at 6 p.m. Antwerp time. And... Yeah, I'm looking forward to tasting these beers and to hearing your experiences with this brewery and this beer. And hopefully I'll get the chance to visit the brewery soon as well. Until then, cheers you guys. See you in the next one.